Well, good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to our NFS Club webinar today from London, uh, just before the Easter break for those of us in the UK when we take four days off. It is also, of course, April Fools, and you may have, uh, as FS Club members, noticed that uh, the FS Club has gone and saved the global economy with a $100 trillion fish. Uh, but today's uh, webinar is actually very serious, and one could make jokes about fool's gold and April Fools and all that. Uh, but actually, Ned has a really important point to make about gold perhaps being the only true measure of performance. And I'm looking very much uh, to hearing his views on that subject, as I know you are. Now, uh, you'll know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zen. And it really is my privilege to be able to introduce these webinars. And I can only do so thanks to the generosity and tolerance of our sponsors. And I uh, have listed the sponsors here. But what they allow us to do is range widely and freely across anything to do with technology, economics, and finance. And as you can imagine, since the days of Midas, and perhaps even before that, although the origins of the value of gold are kind of murky, murky uh, certainly for some 2,600 years, uh, gold has underpinned uh, definitely economics uh, and finance. Uh, but of course, uh, as we've seen recently with chips, so uh, we are putting gold to good industrial uses in certain cases, which hasn't always been such. Now, I'm here today to get out of your way so that you can hear from our expert. Uh, and I'll do so in just a moment. We uh, have got a couple of polls coming up uh, for you, which uh, Ned and I will run just to get the flavor of the audience uh, this morning. Ned will be speaking for approximately 20 minutes uh, and then a vibrant Q&A. And as I know you'll gather uh, from from Ned's presentation, it will be a very vibrant Q&A and a lot of fun. And that's always great to work with. Um, we have uh, posted the slides in, in the area. The recording will be going up approximately uh, 24 to 48 hours uh, from now. And I would encourage you to use the GoToWebinar question facility to either send us comments, observations, or questions. Please do use the GoToWebinar facility because I'm here with you and I won't be getting emails or signals or WhatsApps uh, or any other mechanism. So please do use that facility. All of those questions and comments will be sent to Ned with the email attached to them. So if you've got something you want to send directly or contact Ned, just put it into the question facility and we will make sure that Ned gets all of them. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Ned, the floor is very much yours. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice to be here and to, to make a presentation where I'm not having to think about um, selling a product, but rather discussing the, the, the intellectual angles to do with gold, and I'll probably touch on silver as well a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm aware that the sort of type of person that's going to be listening will, I hope, want to ask questions, and I'm very keen to do that. So if I do leave a little bit extra, um, please hopefully fill it. I dare say Michael could probably do that anyway by firing extra questions at me, but I'm very keen to have a backwards and forwards. It's more amusing for me as well. Um, you know, my, my views are um, hopefully interesting to you, but thoroughly tiresome to me. Uh, uh, as Michael mentioned, there are uh, some polls here. We, we tried to come up with something relatively straightforward about gold. So the first one here is, what percentage of the UK's reserve holdings are in gold? So maybe if you have a click on that. So I've, I've launched the poll, Ned, and uh, we have, as ever with the FS Club, well over half the audience have voted. Uh, we're, we're just up to well over three quarters over the 80% mark. I'm going to close the poll now and share the results. And uh, basically, 60% uh, uh, believe it is 10%. 33% believe it's 30% and sort of insignificant beyond that. Do you want to enlighten us on the right answer or would you rather go to the next poll? Well, I think let's go to the next poll, actually, I think, if you don't mind, Michael. Okay. And then, and then, um, seeing as I think people generally consider the Germans to be, you know, relatively disciplined, one would wonder what, what you think the German percentage is in terms of reserves held in gold. And I've launched that poll now. So folks, fingers on buzzers. And we hit the 50% mark at seven seconds, believe it or not, Ned. So that everybody's awake out there. 
Uh, we're well over 85%. I'm now going to close that poll and share the results. And yes, they do think the Germans are uh, more uh, gold, uh, gold buggy than us. Interesting. That's an interesting, um, interesting sort of difference in accuracy, actually, between the two answers. They're probably informative about where most people are. Um, so I suppose we can probably move ahead and open up the first slide, Mike. Great. Do you want to so, put us out of our misery with an answer to those two? Well, then you can see the answers at the bottom of the slide. So what I've done here today, we, I've just really brought sort of four slides, macro slides that, um, that I, that I talk about occasionally, you know, in a work environment. Uh, because I think that's, they're, they're relevant to, to what we're hopefully going to get into in a minute, which is what, what really matters about gold is what, what people often don't understand, which is actually disinvesting. I mean, physical gold is disinvesting. Um, now this, the UK's, um, percentage being around 10%, it is a function, well, not entirely, but mainly to the, what was called Brown's bottom. So Gordon Brown, was fingered with having been responsible for selling a very large proportion of the UK's gold reserves just before 2000. And the reading I've done and the, the research I've done, I think that this is a misrepresented situation. So what really happened, I think, is the Germans asked for their gold back as, as a part of the creation of the euro from the Bank of England. And due to the fact that central bank gold reserves are, have been loaned, leased, swapped, rehypothecated, effectively the Bank of England didn't have the gold. Um, and we had to give the gold to the Germans at the turn of the millennium. Uh, it was presented as a, a macroeconomic choice by Brown, but it doesn't look very much like that to me. If you really dig into it, you'll see, so you understand the nature of central, central bank gold um, deployment and the fact that New York and London have held on to everybody else's gold ever since World War II. And of course, no one in banking, whether it's central or commercial banking, leave things static um, and, and not um, paying their way. So so there was a clause brought in in the Washington Agreement in 1999 after this happened, saying that there'll be no more loaning, leasing and swapping of member central bank reserves. That was sort of slipped in as a as a um, um, sort of comment in in that document, and I think that's very informative. That's probably well, I'm pretty sure that's what happened. But the thing I think is most interesting here is to, to just consider the fact that the eurozone really is a, is a in, on a reserve level a gold based monetary union. And my view is that the reason for that is because Nixon closing the gold window in 1971 was principally a default on on European creditors. So I believe that the euro was absolutely a direct reaction to that, uh, and indeed was set up for now. So it's a very contrary. I have all sorts of contrary views, but but one of them is is very much that in fact the eurozone is on a monetary level is very cleverly established for exactly now with lots of malice of forethought, uh, because at the end of a, a fiat monetary system, gold gobbles up. Um, the obligations. So if you imagine, I'm hoping that the, the age of the people listening or watching is sufficient to remember this, but at the end of the original Ghostbusters film, the four Ghostbusters stand in the middle of the road and they sort of, they have their guns and they suck all the ghosts into a little box on the road. At the end of it, it closes. That's the function gold performs at the end of, um, uh, pure credit-based monetary system. And if you think about it in that way, the Eurozone is very well positioned for a reset. And I think that when you hear about reset, by the way, all it really is is a revelation of the, met the method. It's a kind of um, uh, you know, revelation of the truth of how this works. But don't be, don't be under any illusion. The US do not have 79% of their reserves in gold. That is very much an accounting point. They still owe their gold under Bretton Woods at $44, not 35 actually, $44 an ounce to international creditors because the Nixon closing the gold window was a temporary legal suspension of the gold window. Temporary as in from then till now, inclusive, but this is not really 
correct what you see below. It's a, it's a, it's a ruse. You know, in fact, it's the eurozone that has the gold with us, not, not, not the US. Certainly in a, on a, on a free accounting level, it is. Um, but the key uh, point I, I, I was hoping to get across, and I'm already waffling now. I apologize. Is this statement here from, from JP Morgan, who said that gold is money and nothing else. And this is a famous quote, and I'm sure many of you have heard it before, but it has lots of meaning and, and it, and it means gold is, is only money, but also that only gold is money. Now, you know, it's a, it's one of those, those lovely quotes that has dual, dual meaning. It's a bit like, um, Soros, who said that gold is the ultimate bubble. Uh, and I love that one as well because, because that's true on both. Both, both meanings of the word ultimate. Um, you know, that's also a very, very good one. But I learned this the hard way personally, which is that I put, well, you don't need to get the violins out, but I, I put, um, an inheritance into gold 2002 because I was worried about the monetary system and I could see that we would end up with a banking crisis. I was a bit early. Um, but I, you know, it was quite obvious once Glass Steagall was repealed under the Clinton administration, it would all end in tears. So I bought gold, but I thought it was an active view. I thought I was going to be extremely rich by being intelligent and taking an active view. And what I've learned over the years is that is absolutely the opposite of the truth. Um, now, my sterling gold's done fine. It's up, I think, six and a half times or something uh, since then, if you if you want to think about it like that. But it buys me exactly the same stuff now as it did when I, when I, when I bought it, which is a shame. Because it certainly wasn't what I thought I was doing when I did that. Um, and there is very important informational value there because gold is money. It's the risk free instrument of the system. That's why central banks have vast amounts of it. That's why it doesn't have a credit rating. It doesn't need one. It's the freestanding money of the system and always was. Now they're not going to tell you this openly and Greenspan and Mervyn King have both said so subsequent to leaving central bank jobs. So if you read what they've said after leaving, they, they, Concur with all of this quite happily, but when they're in the job, you know, it's not really in their interest to, to talk about this stuff. But this is important on all sorts of levels. Um, firstly, it's important in terms of how you allocate to gold, because if you allocate to physical, firstly, you want it removed. You know, best thing is a UK investor is sovereigns in your pocket. That's that's actually disinvesting on a very very profound level. But it, equally, attributions. Um, sense. If you're just buying physical, you're, you're, you're taking an FX position and you're disinvesting. So let's say you have 5% of gold. That's 5% of your capital, which you're saying, I don't want to participate. I don't like FX. I don't trust any of you. This is all dodgy. And you're putting it in the corner of the room and you're saying, I can come back to this in 10 or 20 years and it will buy me the same stuff. And uh, there's a book called The Golden Constant by Roy Jastrom, which is actually for this forum probably appropriate for, for me to mention. It's quite academic. Most, you know, I, I don't expect a Sydney Sheldon if you read that book, but it, it, it very clearly, you know, plots how gold is the risk free and how it measures goods and services, uh, which it does, but it doesn't, you know, it's not Superman. It's not going to do a Clark Kent for you in your portfolio. If you hold a small and physical, it will do better than sterling and it, the euros. Now, just a couple of questions on this slide, if you don't mind. Uh, Bob McDowell is curious, uh, where you've got the gold holdings as a percentage of reserve assets. Uh, do, you know, some of the supranational organizations have gold holdings, you know, the IMF, the World Bank? No. No, they don't. No. They, um, they've often been, um, the Bank of International Settlements is interesting because often it sort of lives in the gold market and, um, and does off uh, off-market transactions on behalf of central banks and was involved in what they were actively in the old, um, movements <laughs> in all sorts of ways. Um, but no, you know, I think that, 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 that's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever had that question asked before. And I think it, what I would say is that I do expect that that will become formalized though through those bodies. So I think the monetary system will be reset through those bodies top down and involve gold but it won't it's not that they hold it themselves um as a as a reserve asset and the second question on this slide uh, for me and harris you, you you talk about growing use cases for industrial use i assume um <clears throat> could you just elaborate on that in, in the sense of are there new things we don't know about i mean i you know we've obviously got uh, circuitry and semiconductors and things but uh, are there newer applications and secondly um 
in, is that it's always been a fractional percentage, but if it's growing roughly, what is it? So industrial demand for 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 gold or for silver, Michael? Which are we asking about? Oh, I, I was asking about gold because of the slide, but okay. both, I guess, really. Well, I mean, so so while it's very it's very very small, I mean, I think it's sort of two percent, something like that, of um, of consumption is in in industry. You know, gold is stockpile. Gold is 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 the money of kings. Silver, of course, is much more interesting because it's actually real money. You know, it's being used by the by the plebs, um, and it's also far more occulted and hated by central bankers than gold. Is far more like Bitcoin silver. You know, it's absolutely what Bitcoin would like to be, which is real money used by the plebs, uh, at, and and not requiring the central bank or anybody to confirm its its utility or or importance. You know, um, and its um, growing uses are just mind boggling. You know, it, it, whether it's germicidal, um, you know, antibacterial, five G Internet of Things, solar panels electric vehicles now at the margin gold has all these uses too because i just clarify something basically they're the same thing michael you know got silver tarnishes and gold is not reflected and that's an important one not reflected but um really they're very 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 similar in their properties it's just that you get 70 ounces of silver for an ounce of gold and through history some there'll be moments where silver's been more highly prized than gold but really, they're the same thing, and, and you know, and of course, all our words for money come from silver, not from gold. You know, gold is not gold is not money; it's a, it's risk-free collateral, and they're not quite the same thing. Um, but this, what's interesting about silver at the moment is we have these colliding new demand drivers. One being um, EV, you know, solar panels, electrification, and the other being investment demand, uh, where people are suddenly going, you know, what? Because of the monetary system, I quite like a bit of silver in the portfolio. Well, you know, in silver, there isn't, there are no silver around. It's all being consumed in industry. Whereas in gold, all the gold ever mined is available. So they're quite different in that way. Um, and that's why I love them together. You know, they're very, they're, they're very complementary, but also different in their nature. I like to describe silver as kind of the, the crown prince, you know, the unruly, badly behaved and more fun version of, um, of gold. Let's I go on. Really an interesting book where they pointed out that when it came to decoration, gold predominated in lower latitudes and silver predominated in the higher latitudes where you wanted increased reflectivity. Um, just a quick one, if you don't mind. Richard Parlow would like you to just repeat the name of that book you referenced earlier and its author just slowly so he can hear it and write it down. Golden Constant by Roy Jastram, J-A-S-T-R-A-M. That's good. Um, and Christopher Gleadle's curious, you know, with uh, going back to silver, as you mentioned, with the uh, solar panels and all, with the growth of renewable energy, where do you see silver pricing in the future? Well, we have a slide that I will get onto in a minute where I will give you the most outrageous sizzle about where I think silver may be going. So um, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Great. Do you want me to move along a bit? I think so, because otherwise we'll get, we could get stuck in t entirely on any of these slides. So, so this is, is my expression of the observation I've already made, but I think it's helpful, which is, you know, I, you know, I run a fund in gold and silver and I still look at gold going up and silver going up, but they're not doing it. Just as I've told you, they don't do that. They, they're just gold and silver. They're measuring the loss of purchasing power of sterling and dollars. And the way I like to describe this is as like a slinky, you know, one of those children's toys that goes down the, down the stairs. Um, you know, it's just like a wire toy rolls down. Now, the, the, the government issued monetary system is very much like that, which it rolls down the stairs versus gold and individual parts of the slinky are always moving at slightly different rates compared to other parts of the slinky. You know, slinky isn't one movement. You know, there are elements within it that move at different speeds. And we're rolling off, I think, the final step of this particular monetary system. Uh, so analogy wise, I think that works quite well as, to explain where we are at the moment. Um, we're about to roll off that, that step you see here. But, you know, this slide doesn't necessarily need that much color. It's just to remind one, don't get too excited about what's going on the gold price. You know, Michael asked me before we came on, you know, what's gold doing at the moment? The answer is gold's not doing anything. <laughs> gold doesn't do anything. Gold's just gold. So the question he was asking was, what's sterling doing? That's actually what he meant when he asked me, what's gold doing? 
because presuming we're all in the UK, and I'm sure we're probably not, but let's say we're all in the UK. When you ask what gold's doing, what you're asking is, what is sterling doing in the bond market at the moment? And the answer is, for the last six months, sterling has been rallying versus the risk-free due to the bond markets, in my belief, in incoherent and, and, and incorrect belief that uh, policies will become more hawkish. So, in other words, the central bankers have become very flatlined in their in their guidance, and the market gets either over dovish or over hawkish relative to the guidance. In the last six months, the market's been focused on on a hawkish narrative. So, long sterling has looked quite attractive in the bond market for the last six months, which means sterling gold, if you want to talk about it like that, has been going down. Uh, but of course, that's not happening. Gold is just gold. Now, the interesting one, and and um. I sometimes forget to mention this, and this is quite provocative towards hedge fund managers, but I enjoy doing that um, because I think they're useless. Is uh, and they just like to charge lots of fees, do absolutely nothing except give you word salad. Uh, is that they don't beat the risk-free instrument? Ned, you seem to have frozen. You can still hear me, though? Yeah, we got you back now. Yeah, so Robert Pay thinks the Hedge Fund Association just intervened. They're everywhere. Someone lost their... Here, Ned, just to react to, um, and it's about China. Do you want to take those now? Yes. Um, well, in fact, you and I uh, were doing some work uh, over a decade ago on on China, and it was the first time it dawned on me that China is responsible for about a quarter of the market, but also about a quarter of the production, and that was then. I, I don't know the current figures. Uh, Stuart Daly is curious. He says, figures for Chinese gold holdings, uh, he's curious about your view on these official uh, holdings. Is it accurate? Many suggest not, and that one day um, China will back its currency with huge gold holdings to challenge the dollar. Uh, Johnny Fry is curious, you know, the Chinese seem to hold on to the gold they mine, uh, so their gold holdings are high. Do you think the Chinese may use their holdings to partially back their new digital currency? Well, I think we're heading into techno-socialism. The Chinese are well up for it. So I don't think they're willing to, I don't think they want to break rank at all. But, I, but, they, but they definitely want to consume as much gold at central bank level as they can to try and offset the, the stand in the last months, um, you know, it's passing through their fingers, i.e. US Treasuries. And it's not in their interest to declare their holdings on a regular basis or even at all, frankly. Um, so what does make sense is they don't let gold or silver leave the country, that they, that they, you know, that they're buying up or allowing into the domestic economy the, the annual mine supply. Um, but I'm not of the belief that they're going to break rank and, you know, back the yuan with gold and try and pull down the system. It, it, it's just not on a on a political level to me. This doesn't make any sense. It's just it's just not what's what's coming. But they certainly don't declare their reserves correctly, and it's not in their interest to do so. Because if they suddenly did, then the, then the gold price would just ramp, and it would be too late for them to accumulate any more. So it's very much in their interest to sort of play rope a dope uh, on their on their reserves. Thank you. So what, what, what Michael's put up here is my favorite slide at the moment, which is the gold price with no um, price axis at all and um, a large sort of fancy looking cup and handle formation. So what I'm showing you here is is the gold price adjusted backwards for the CPI. Um, so effectively showing you that, that if you use um, government inflation statistics, that gold's hit the same level three times in our in our lifetimes of, of around two thousand dollars an hour. And it was no surprise that when we hit that level last year that we did come off because it's a very important level. And indeed, it marked the, the in my view, it marked the handle of a monster cup and handle uh, technical pattern. Now, um, it's yeah, fun you just make, a few of the audience won't be familiar with uh, some of this chartist uh, terminology. Do you just want to explain a cup and handle and what it means normally? Yes. 
So cup and handle, you can hopefully see what, 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 what on that slide what the cup and handle would be, which is you know a large bowl and then a handle on the right hand side, you know, like sort of teacup style um, or, or fancy coffee cup style. Um, and it's the most bullish pattern there is. It's the pattern that you look for if you want to buy something that's going to go up a lot. Uh, it's, it's basic amateur hour technicals, really, and I'm certainly no, you know, uh, professional chartist. But I do think that the way the markets now are so momentum focused, that chart breakouts in, are particularly important now because uh, we were discussing earlier that, that um, the market is now like a, like an ice hockey pylon. Um, uh, or pile up, I can't remember what the phrase is, you know, where everyone just scrums on something. And I think that when gold breaks out above this, this generational number of 2000, the entire market will turn towards it and it will be a massive pile on in gold, silver and, and gold and silver mining stocks. And, the, and, and my analogy here is look back to the 1970s. So in 1971, we had Nixon closing the gold window. And in 2009, we had the, the, the start of QE. And in both cases, the market worried immediately about loss of purchasing power. You might want to call it inflation, but that's not what it is. It's about loss of purchasing power. So both things made people worry about money losing purchasing power. So, so investors bought gold. And in both cases, you can see gold went up a lot straight away. Uh, but these kinds of monetary policy moves are slow. They're not one arm bandits, you know, crank prices. It doesn't work like that. It's very slow. Uh, and in the 1970s, it took nearly 10 years before we had a really big move in gold and silver. And the reason it went straight up gold and silver is because, the, as it says on here, the previous breakout from 1974 was left behind. So, so gold went up to 1974 to a particular point, backed off 50%. And there was the moment where the, the price from before had been left behind. But then the momentum of the market turned and went, wow, oh wow, this is really happening now. Let's, let's, let's pile on. Uh, and gold and silver went up massively. And the only thing that stopped it, of course, and in fact stopped the, the breaking of the entire financial system at that moment was Volcker taking real interest rates to about positive six. So they took, they took, they took rates to 20, uh, with inflation about 14, something like that. Mm. Uh, you were getting paid five or six percent holding cash in the bank. That was sufficient to get people to sell their gold and silver and put money back into the banking system. Now, obviously, the inference here is this time you won't be seeing any of that. You know, you see <laughs> that kind of policy. Uh, indeed, they've told you openly that's not going to be happening. So the inference here is when we break through 2000 at some point in the next year or two, and it could be the next month or two, I don't know, you know, anything very loose will make it happen. Um, I think you'll get this kind of move and then you'll have the reset that they've been telling you is coming because you will not have rates dragged above inflation in order to uh, refloat the system, as we saw in 1980. That's not happening this time. This time we get the new system, the new monetary system, cashless, fully tracked, monitored, all those jolly things. And I would, in my view, absolutely uh, with the discipline of gold initially. I mean, that will disappear over time. But that's how, you know, we'll have our Ghostbusters moment. All the all the gates just fly back into the box. We start again. You get your digital money, and on we go. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Angel Gavier, I was sort of curious. In your previous uh, slide, look at prices, that chart shows that uh, the U.S. dollar and the euro are fairly flat-ish against uh, gold since the global financial crisis, and that's despite a heck of a lot of QE. Any comments on that? Well, I mean, the previous slide is is more about trying to show the shape. I mean, actually, in fact, the euro has been relatively flat, but the dollar hasn't. So the dollar and sterling being massive deficit economies and currencies, they actually uh, collapsed really against gold over a few years compared to, let's say, the euro or, or, or other more export-based um, currencies. And then, of course, both sterling and dollar looked like they were basically going to go to the woodshed. And then suddenly we got this policy announcement about um, raising rates lots of times, unwinding the balance sheet. And then suddenly, you know, sterling and dollars got that, got their mojo back and came back the other way. So, so you'll find that actually that's more to do with um, twin deficits and, and the viability of, it's all about the viability 
of holding your currency, whether it's euro, sterling or dollars, long. Not short long. It's about, do I want to hold sterling, euro or dollar long, or do I want to hold gold? I see them as like two runways. Wherever you are in the world, you have two runways ahead of you. One is holding gold, one is holding your domestic fiat flavor. And and you've got one year, three year, five, seven, ten, thirty, or whatever on your runway. And they'll be the opposite of each other. Um, Rory Langford makes a good point here about the measurement of inflation, because a lot of this argument is based on purchasing power uh, yep. relative to fiat currencies. Um, <clears throat> his understanding is that governments significantly adjust how they measure inflation over time. For example, the Clinton administration's adjustments in the early 90s. How do yep. you measure inflation? Well, I think that Rory probably knows what I know about that, you know, and maybe he's subscribed to shadow stats like I am. Um, I, I even pay, I pay shadow stats for their data, Rory, um, and I adjust Bloomberg charts for John Williams spreadsheets um, for my own amusement and to terrorize my colleagues. Um, you know, most of the time, I don't know what on earth I'm showing, them, but it's quite amusing when you do it. So, look, the, the, the fun part about that, that conversation is really, you know, there's a great academic paper on the front of the shadowstats.com website. Which, which talks about, um, chained, unchained CPI and adjustments and all of this and gives you the, the historical narrative to that story. And, um, my favorite part of it is how the language changed because, of course, everything really is all about language, as we all know. Um, everything. Always about language. And in the early 1980s, they were forced to change the language surrounding how inflation is measured because until 1980, I think in 1983, um, that, uh, the government had only used a fixed basket to measure inflation. So that was called until 1983, a constant standard of living. So your inflation was, was, was judged on the basis of a constant standard of living. And then because they started to make all these adjustments, um, the language surrounding that also had to change. And it became since 1983, a constant level of satisfaction. So, you have actually been judged uh, on the basis of a bureaucrat's view of your level of satisfaction, and that's really all it is. In fact, I think I'm being quite generous by putting it like that. It's far worse than that, obviously. And indeed, this is what causes populism, is the fact that, um, you know, inflation really is six to eight annualized, and uh, if you're accessing capital, or rather accessing credit, rather, at you know, zero, one, or two versus the plebs of 1,000. And meanwhile, the plebs are eating 6 to 8% annualized inflation. That's where you get populism. Um, We've got about 10 minutes, and I didn't want to miss the very important silver argument, so I've moved the slide ahead here. Yeah. So we looked at inflation-adjusted gold. So I thought, you know, let's let's put my, my salesy silver slide in there because it's quite fun and it's amusing to, to talk about. Now, silver is the populist method. It's the one which is way more, you know, it's called the widow maker. And, it, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing to invest in for a very long period. Well, not terrible, but it can be very bad if you buy the rallies uh, and get excited at the wrong moment, you know, because you can be sitting there for a very long time waiting for it to come back. Um, but it also, I think, has the potential to go up um, really massively compared to gold. And the reason is is there's a historical component to this narrative, which is important to put, particularly in, again in this forum, which is that silver is genuinely hated by the states. They do not like it at all. You know, it's it's way more difficult for them to um to manage money which is which is used in people's hands versus being, you know, physical collateral held in banks. And after World War Two and bear in mind that silver was demonetized anyway, 60, 70, 80, depends how you want to describe it, 60, 70, 80 years before gold. But after World War II, um, a, a group came together called the Silver Users Association. It's recently been renamed, and I can't remember what it calls itself, but it's taken silver out of the name to try and hide. But this is the only legal buy-side cartel in anything. And it's been around since World War II. And this is the arms manufacturers, you know, the military car manufacturers, chemicals manufacturers, anything you like, because they all need silver. And they lobbied the uh, through Congress after World War II to get hold of the monetary silver at actually a, a discount and succeeded. 
Uh, and so all the silver was removed from the, from the, from the monetary system after World War II by the Youth Association. And they've been around ever since, and they've been basically been removing silver from the Earth's crust at uh, sub-economic prices. Even the U.S. Geological Survey agrees that silver will be the first thing to be exhausted from the Earth's crust. And it's because it's been, it's been, you know, beaten up, taken out of the bank and, and, and pummeled repeatedly over the decades. But what that means, of course, is it now has this extraordinary squeeziness. Because industry still needs the stuff. You can't have, we're all looking at screens. You can't have anything without silver. You know, you're, you're, everything that we use in the modern economy has to have tiny amounts of silver. It could replace it for gold, as we discussed earlier. But, you know, that requires a 70x price move, um, for silver versus gold. And hopefully that happens. But, you know, I think for the time being, you can be confident they'll still need silver in all of these myriad applications. And yet industry consumes silver in a just in time basis. Like you go to the, grocer and buy herbs and they don't stockpile anything they're relying on the banking system to deliver mesh wire powder uh for the manufacturing process now if we use that same inflation adjusted number so um as we agreed this doesn't cover it at all not even slightly but we're still going to use the government's inflation data now this is the quarterly chart so it doesn't include the monthly high in 1980 and in fact, in monthly high 1980, adjusted for the CPI was about $180 an ounce. So silver hit $180 an ounce in 1980. Um, now, obviously, what I'm suggesting is that doesn't cover it at all. And indeed, now there are way more powerful forces at work. That does not involve me making a price prediction, etc. you know, disclaimers, blah, blah, blah. But... I think we're on the brink of a very, very big move because what suddenly happened, which is really odd, is people are buying physical silver with, with cash. So they're not using leverage. The two moves you see here in silver, one in 2011 and one in 1980, were leverage-based moves. They were, they were, they were incorrectly applied. Um, because if you do that, you're assuming the exchange and the banks and, and the state won't collude behind the scenes too. Hugh Purser reminds us of, a uh... Bunker Hunt. Uh, I can't remember. Was that the 1980 peak? Was that? Yeah. And uh, could the market still be cornered, or, or is it being cornered? It's being cornered at the moment, but it's being cornered the right way by in fully cash paid longs. This is exactly the point. Whereas that's not what Bunker Hunt did. Bunker Hunt lost his position because he didn't do it like that. Drexel Burnham incorrectly or, or, or badly advised him to, you know, you. And if you see margin heights in the middle of the night, you know, nudge, nudge, that's a problem. And that happened in 2011 as well, by the way, the whole series of, of margin hikes. And there was lots of, of, of leverage longs in there. And that will unwind. But what's happening this time is lots of, of kind of what I would call dumb longs, you know, private client PMs and stuff. It's going, oh, I like this silver thing. It sort of makes sense. Basic supply demand thing makes sense, you know, but this is all, this is all one times long cash pay buying. Both in physical and in SLB, which is the biggest ETF. Now, SLB changed its perspective two months ago now without telling it. Yeah. So you sort of answered Chris Gleadle's question that with the growth of renewable energy, that's another pressure on this price going up. Yeah, good. Um, <clears throat> Bob McDowell's kind of curious. Why did the notion of bimetallism fall into disrepute or out of fashion? Uh, does it have any chance of revival? And if so, under what conditions? Um, it, well, it would be wonderful if it did, but I, I think that that's way too libertarian and, um, not where we're heading. That doesn't really hit the, the, the techno socialist, um, sort of buttons in my, in my view. Um, you know, it'd be great if that happened. In fact, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that to do with, um, the Wizard of Oz being okay. about by methodism. I don't know if any of you know that, but you should look that up too. It's a really interesting argument that that book is actually about by method, um, with the, 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 yeah. the monetary yeah, the yellow brick road, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. But also remember that she wore silver slippers in the book, not That's red. Right. That's right. Yeah, Frank Baum was definitely a, a bimetallism. He was a, a, a fan of uh, uh, Jennings Bryan uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, um, just a Simon West is curious. How, how do you see silver behaving if or when gold uh, breaks above two thousand? Well, look, I think that silver above 30 is going to go uncontrolled. And I think it will be gold going up that will take silver through 30. So 30 was the level last year. 
2000 was 11 in gold last year. It will be something dovish to do with dollars and the market's view on dollars that will drive gold back through 2000. It will drag silver with it. And then you'll see a whole load of dumb long money piled into the silver ETF. And the silver ETF is already almost closed because there's no silver. So what will happen is, you know, the, the, the SLV claimed to add, just for context here, in late January, 110 million ounces of silver in three days due to demand for SLV. And this is the point where no one's talking about this and this isn't a momentum story. It was just, it just, it just got out slightly for three days. Now, 110 million ounces in three days. Total global mine supply is about 850 million ounces at the moment. And investment demand is about a quarter of total demand. So this is, this is going to get very, very, um, spicy at a certain point but you do have to get through that technical level get your scrum down and then and then and then that will happen but i think that yeah silver is is probably a passenger to gold for now and we need that shift in in the bond market's view about forward dollars before we get that um angel gavier again uh how have etfs in gold and silver influenced the prices they do, well so what I said about silver, you know, they don't influence the price, but in silver, they could be a big problem because it's, there's just no silver. You know, gold is not like that. But understand that the, the, the average, you know, daily turnover in gold is two to four hundred billion dollars equivalent. Physical is two to three percent of that. And ETFs are part of the physical market. So it's my contention that really it has nothing to do with it. You know, it really it sets that and it should do and it certainly used to before bullion banking was conceived of, uh, um, coincidentally or not, straight after 1980. So in other words, gold and silver gave the system a massive black eye in 1780. Real rates were taken to plus six, the system was refloated, and then suddenly this bullion banking industry just emerges, which is like a dampener between uh, the people and sound money. And Hugh Purser again, uh, any, any comments on private holdings of gold, you know, especially the the classic, you know, Indian family argument. Well, look, I think that um, the importance there is not the Indian family. The importance is the Western buyer. Because, you know, as I said, the physical market is what the Indians and Chinese and stuff uh, participate in. And they're all well aware of all of this already. And they already do this. What matters is the financial channel, the 97%, you know, where we have untold trillions of 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 worthless fiat sort of sludge uh, sw- swashing around needing to find refuge. So while I, I, I you know, that that will continue and it does continue. And in fact, we've seen a pickup in buying lately while the gold price has been softer in, in India and China. You've seen that come through. Uh, it doesn't, it's not really what matters. What matters is uh, obligations of gold, and obligations of silver that have been issued by the financial services industry being called by by the investor and saying, well, where is it? What's, I want the real one. That's that's really the, the key. And a final question, sadly, uh, in the time available. Um, a lot of people are curious about your views on rare earth met- metals. Do they have a store of a value role in the future alongside gold and, to a lesser extent, silver? Um, no, no, they're not money. They don't trade in foreign exchange markets and they ever will. I mean, it's possible. You know, the idea of the platinum coin was floated, of course, and platinum is a bit like a rare earth metal in a way. Um, I mean, I, I'm not saying that they would, those things wouldn't outperform gold and silver on a, on a, on a, you know, on an outcome basis, by the way. They may well do, but they are, they are rare commodities versus monetary instruments, which is what we're really talking about here. Well, Ned, uh, sadly, we, we, we come to time, but it's been a delightful way, a lot to cogitate over a long weekend here in the UK. Um, I just love your points about it being gold being the opposite, you know, sort of to the real interest rate. Uh, I loved your Ghostbusters analogy of, you know, <laughs> just sucking up uh, uh, the money as it's there. Um, and I know um, a lot of people might be going out and buying the book that you recommended, The Gold Constant. Um, so a, lo- a lot to think about. Um, just one quick question, um, and uh, you, you must have had this before, but I'll, I'll throw it in. Johnny Fry, quick answer, Ned. Uh, out of interest, what percentage of your portfolio do you hold in gold? Well, you know, it's an alarming answer. I, I don't own anything else. 
you know, I, I don't, but that's because I understand it's the risk free. So weirdly, that's, it sounds highly dangerous and, and, and risky, but I see it completely the other way around, which is why I don't want to participate in the, in the system as it is at the moment. So I, I'm, I'm complete 100%. What a fantastic commitment you've got. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and I'm getting some questions about my holdings as well, but uh, we'll leave that to one side. But I do hold some gold and I'll leave it at that. Um, it's really been delightful to have you, Ned. You're always, you're always great fun. You know that. And hopefully uh, you and I can have a chin wag, uh, more appropriately after this. But I've got three quick rounds of thanks to give. Uh, firstly, as ever to our sponsors, I hope that you found this, uh, interesting. And again, thank you for allowing us to range uh, widely across the piece. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, you're obviously very interested in, in what's going on. Yes, uh, after Easter, we open up with uh, some interesting debates again. So please do join us as ever. Go to the website. That's the easiest thing rather than me reading them out to you. Uh, but I really must thank uh, Ned Naylor Leland from Jupiter Asset Management. Um, a, a delight for you to come forward and share uh, your ever informed thoughts. Um, I'm afraid, Ned, that technology does not allow us to open up the floodgates of applause, but I, I have uh, my Korean karmic clapper, um, which we'll have to substitute, I'm afraid. And may I wish everyone uh, a good Easter. And Ned, I understand you're moving this weekend, and I wish you a smooth move uh, over the bank holiday weekend. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Michael.